What star sign are you? Gemini. Since I don't know anything about Gemini except my wife once. <laughs> Yeah, let's start, sir. Uh, already 60 doctors has joined. Yeah, Dr. Rao? Yeah, I am ready, Shantan. Okay, okay. So, good evening to all of you. I am Shantanu Mukherjee, your host for the evening. On behalf of Torrent Pharma, I welcome you all to this special online CME under Back to Basics program. Today, we have gathered to discuss on cardiovascular system and pathophysiological basics. I welcome Dr. Sudhakar Rao, who is the chief organizer of this program. And for presentation and discussion on the topic, I welcome our respected speaker for the day, Dr. Sudhakar Rao Ala, senior consultant cardiologist of Krishna Institute of Medical Science, Hyderabad. I am sure this unique platform where evidence meets experience will help all to enrich their knowledge during these COVID times. Being the host of this program, uh, let me brief some important aspect of this program. All participants to please keep their mics muted except the panelists. This is to avoid background noise. If you have any question to ask, please use the chat option and send it to us. And we shall present to the panel your, your question to the panel member for answering. You can send your question anytime during the discussion. So once again, I welcome you all and request our respective speaker, Dr. Rao, to start sitting for them. Dr. Deva Sagar. Thank you, Shantanu. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk on uh, cardiac symptoms, evaluation and the pathophysiological basis of these cardiac symptoms. Uh, this is a basic understanding of these things will help you to evaluate the cardiac patients better. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. What are symptoms? Symptoms are systematic collection of information as told by the patient. You should allow the patient to speak freely, uninterruptedly, either by the attendant or by the doctor, so that he can express the symptoms or he can express his problems freely and uh, untainted by any other uh, information from the bystanders or from the attenders. This is more so important because uh, uh, the full understanding or full expression may be slightly different uh, from the what the attendant can perceive of the symptom of the patient. In patients who have got a cognitive impairment, the information given by the attendant may be equally useful. Just as a bystander information in patients with syncope is extremely useful. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so what is the purpose of uh, eliciting these symptoms and interpretation of these symptoms? First, these symptoms will allow us to, to know 
whether the patient has got uh, any cardiac disease or the presence of the disease. And knowing the severity of the symptoms, we can also know the severity of the disease. And finally, we can also know the type of diseases depending upon various factors, including the age at onset. For example, the patient develops symptoms at the age of six years. It is very likely that the disease is mostly congenital rather than acquired. Just as the occurrence of a disease in a 60-year-old man is more in favor of a vascular disease rather than any other congenital heart defect. It will also tell us uh, whether it is a congenital disease or acquired disease, especially if there is a history of uh, coexisting history of rheumatic fever or whatever it is, which might help us in knowing what is the nature of the disease. Progression of the symptoms for, the, for a period of time during the course of uh, this disease will tell us whether the, whether the disease is progressing slowly or faster. If it is progressing is rapid, then the differential diagnosis will be totally different. And we can also try to get from the history whether this rapid downhill course is caused by cardiac factors or non-cardiac factors like infection, anemia, etc. Can I have the next slide? Finally, symptom evaluations also gives us some idea about the response to therapy, be it a drug therapy or interventional therapy like an angioplasty or a valvuloplasty, or the effect of surgery on the symptoms. You need to understand, you need to evaluate, you need to ask the patient after the intervention or after the drug therapy, what happened to the symptoms? Is there near total, what do you call, uh, the resolution of symptoms? Or is there any partial resolution of symptoms? Or there is no resolution of symptoms, but on the contrary, there may be even worsening of the symptoms. So that, does, that will also tell us what has been the response of the disease to the drug therapy or interventions. Can I have the next slide? <clears throat> Symptom elicitation from the patient requires a lot of skill and tact. Suddenly practicing of eliciting the history improves your ability to get the right information from the patient. And as I said earlier, patients should be allowed to speak uninterruptedly. And the answer should be an open end in the sense that do not interrupt the patient's flow of the talk or symptoms, either by the doctor or by the attendant. So this is uh, history taking, especially eliciting the symptoms requires a lot of experience and a lot of skill and it should be focused evaluation of the symptoms. Can I have the next slide? Next slide, please. Okay. So what are the cardiovascular symptoms that are suggestive of a cardiac disease or a vascular disease? Please go back to the previous slide. Yeah, okay. So the symptoms, chest pain, yeah, palpitations, syncope and presyncope, edema of the dependent areas, and claudication of the limbs, be it lower limbs or upper limbs, and presence of cyanosis, which may be noticed by the patients or their attendants. It is important to remember that these symptoms Sometimes the cardiovascular disease will have symptoms referred to other systems like a history of uh, dysphagia or a hoarseness of the voice or a neuro deficit in patients who have developed a cerebral embolism consequent to an atrial fibrillation in a valvular heart disease. So you should also think, elicit not only the cardiovascular symptoms but also symptoms referable to other systems. Can I have the next slide? Okay, chest pain is the most common symptoms, especially in these times. In the last decade or so, chest pain is the most presenting cardiovascular symptoms nowadays. Quite frequent and uh, it is important that you should evaluate the chest pain symptom in great detail. 
don't be very casual about interpretation of chest pain as anginal or non-anginal. If the it is more often than not, it is not the pain, but it is the discomfort over the chest, or more specifically, uneasiness within the chest. This uneasiness can be location, maybe substernal or left pectoral, or very rarely right pectoral, and sometimes even in the epigastria. So once you know the location, you should also ask what is the duration of the discomfort. Each one component of these chest pain syndromes has got a lot of inner meaning and a lot of uh, clinical relevance. Normally, an anginal pain does not last for more than 10 to 15 minutes. If it lasts for hours or days, it is less likely to be a cardio, cardio that is ischemic pain rather than any other pain. There are other pains of the cardiovascular system that really last for a longer period, like pericardial pain. By and large, an ischemic cardiac pain generally does, does not last more than 10 to 15 minutes. The pain often not only present in the substernal region, but does radiate to various regions, you know, up to the lower jaw or up to the epigastrium, and uh, certainly to the left arm in most of the situations, and occasionally to both arms, and very rarely it can radiate into the interscapular region. But what is important with this discomfort is, it is consistently precipitated by physical effort and consistently relieved either by taking rest or by taking sublingual nitrates. Uh, so the precipitating factors and relieving factors should be, should be evaluated. Precipitating factors need not necessarily be effort, physical effort. It can also be precipitated by emotional stress. It can also be precipitated by overeating full stomach. And it can also be precipitated by, by walking in a cold weather, especially in a chilly winter. More so in the West rather than in our country. Less so in South India, more so in North India. So basically you need to know the relationship of the discomfort of the chest in relation to effort, emotion, eating, and environment. And relieving factors, rest, and also sublingual nitrate. It is important to remember that ischemic chest pain becomes worse when you lie down flat. It gets relieved when you sit up on the, at the edge of the bed and then hang your legs at the edge of the bed. The idea, I'll explain to you all these things, why this happens. Can I have the next slide? It is very unusual that all patients will give you the classical the description of substernal discomfort, precipitated by effort, relieved by rest. <coughs> so Forrester and Diamond have devised uh, these three characteristics like where is the location and character of the discomfort, precipitating factors, and relieving factors. If all three factors are present, it is called a typical angina. If only two out of three are present, we say it is atypical chest pain. If only one is present, we say it is a non-cardiac chest pain. This is very relevant when we come back to the history again in the next few slides. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so to, for you to understand why the pain becomes more on effort and relieved by rest, we need to understand that what are the major determinants of myocardial oxygen demands, major determinants. So for the four major determinants of myocardial oxygen demands are, one is heart rate, second one is the blood pressure, more so the systolic blood pressure, third one is the contractility, fourth one is the wall stress. So if there is any condition that increases the heart rate, so the chance of precipitating an ischemic episode is high because heart requires more blood to, to do extra work. And in the presence of a obstructive coronary artery disease, this cannot be achieved. So if any of the four or in various combination occur in a given situation, that is either increase in the heart rate or increase in blood pressure, or increase in contractility, 
or an increase in wall stress. What do you mean by wall stress is the stress on the wall of the ventricle, which is related to cavity size, that is, that, that the larger the cavity size, and the greater is the stress on the on the left ventricular wall. And the greater the thickness of the left ventricular wall, the lesser will be the wall stress. So cavity size is directly proportional to the wall stress. And wall thickness is inversely proportional to the wall stress. So what happens when you are well when you sit down with your legs hanging at the edge of the bed, there is pooling of the blood in the legs, and then there will be less venous return to the to the heart. So the cavity size decreases, so the wall stress decreases, so the so the need or the demand for oxygen will become less. On the contrary, if you force the patient to lie down flat on the bed, his pain will not be relieved. And if you really take the history properly, most of the patients will say that their discomfort is relieved by sitting up in the bed. So don't force them to lie down in the bed in the sense saying that uh, you should take rest and lie down flat. Lying down flat certainly will exacerbate the ischemic chest pain. That's one of the clues that somebody getting up in the middle of the night and then says after sitting up for about 15 minutes, his pain is relieved, consider the possibility of a coronary ischemic pain. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, not only you should uh, diagnose the presence or suspect coronary artery disease based on the symptoms and its characteristics, but you should also try to evaluate whether the type of angina is it stable angina or or what we call in the in the in the new terminology a chronic coronary artery disease or is it acute coronary syndrome so how do we decide clinically based on the symptoms so if the patient has been having chest discomfort and you have made a diagnosis possibly coronary artery disease and anginal pain you need to ask what is the frequency of chest pain what is the duration of discomfort? And what is the threshold of angina? <coughs> when we say th this threshold of angina, we mean how much distance he was able to walk without getting any chest discomfort. If there are no changes in the last one month in the frequency of the chest pain or the duration of discomfort or no change in the threshold, then we say probably it is a chronic coronary artery disease and not an acute coronary syndrome. Rest angina is a very important uh, symptom and it almost always indicates a very severe disease calling for urgent investigations and therapy. Nocturnal angina meaning that the patient gets pain only during the night time. He gets up and then sits for a while and then the pain is relieved and then goes back to sleep. Nocturnal angina is quite often a sign of an incipient left heart failure, left ventricle failure. Nocturnal angina is also a symptom of uh, coronary artery disease, especially in patients with aortic regurgitation. What happens is that when you sleep, your heart rate comes down, so the duration of diastole increases. Consequently, that the magnitude of aortic regurgitation also increases because aortic regurgitation is a diastolic event and the longer the diastole, the longer the duration of regurgitation, so the magnitude of regurgitation increases. Consequently, that the need for myocardial oxygen increases because left ventricle go on stretching. Postprandial angina is also a very serious symptom and you specifically ask, postprandial angina is almost synonymous with a incipient triple vessel disease. They may not get the pain on walking on empty stomach, but they will get pain after a meal, even however light it is. He says, I'm able to walk about two kilometers on empty stomach early in the morning, six o'clock. But in the evening when I go for a walk at 4 p.m. after having a snack and a tea, I can't even walk half a kilometer. This is one of the manifestations that postprandial angina per se, in the sense, Full stomach per se can precipitate angina, but full stomach food or after the meal also it, it does reduce the threshold of angina. Basically, because after food, 
that the there is an inappropriately higher heart rate, inappropriately higher systolic blood pressure for the same given amount of exercise. That is the reason why soon after a meal, their angina is a bit more frequent. Finally, we have a second wind phenomena. That means his patient says, at the, at the beginning, he has some discomfort after walking about 300, 500 yards. And afterwards, he continues to walk and then there is no discomfort at all. <coughs> this is not common, but it does happen. One of the theories to explain this kind of a thing is there is obstructive coronary artery disease with some collaterals feeding the obstructed coronary artery. These collaterals are not sufficient to maintain or to, sub to supply enough of uh, uh, what do you call oxygen at the resting period. But when the patient starts to walk, the collaterals start to dilate. And then it does increase the coronary blood flow to the myocardium. So initially, there will be angina, but continued walking results in probable dilatation of the collateral vessels feeding the obstructed coronary artery, and that will overcome the increased demands uh, consequent to the exercise. This concept of variable threshold angina has to be understood. What do we mean by variable threshold angina? That means some days he says he's able to walk two kilometers early in the morning. Other days he says he cannot walk about uh, not even half a kilometer. So whenever a patient gives a variable threshold angina, you have to suspect there is an additional vasospastic coronary artery disease. So there is not only fixed obstruction to the coronary artery, but there is also a superadded coronary artery spasm, whatever may be the reason for spasm. So variable threshold angina, you have to ask the patient specifically, otherwise you will not be able to volunteer. You will not be able to understand the significance of the variable threshold angina. Because this has got some therapeutic importance. If the angina has got a variable threshold, you should not only give anti-anginal drugs, which are beta blockers and nitrates and other things, also, you have to give drugs which will prevent coronary artery spasm, including calcium channel blockers, in addition to beta blockers. So, this is historical one. So, once you know the stable angina or acute coronary syndrome, you should also note down what is the severity, what is the number of episodes in a day or in a week. And one of the indirect ways of uh, evaluating the severity of angina is to ask the patient how many sublingual nitrates he has used per day and whether the number of tablets being used, is it the same, is it increasing or is it decreasing? That will give us whether the angina has been stable or it is becoming an acute coronary syndrome. So this evaluation, not only you should be able to make a diagnosis of angina, but you also make the diagnosis whether it is a chronic coronary artery disease or a stable angina or whether the patient is entering into the acute coronary phase. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So, Canadian Cardiovascular Society has summarized, put all these things into, into one category, what they call classification of angina. And there, what they have used is, are the symptoms interfering with your ordinary physical activity, ordinary daily physical activity? If they're not interfering, then that's fine. That is class one. On the contrary, the patient is symptomatic even at rest and is unable to do any activities that becomes class 4. Class 2 is a slight limitation, occasional limitation. Whenever he tries to do rapid work or walk against the gradient or he gets emotionally disturbed. Class 3 is there's a marked limitation of activity of angina and minimal activity can be done. <clears throat> but there is no angina at rest. So basically you need to ask what are the, is it interfering with his daily activities or not interfering with daily activities? If it is not interfering with your daily physical activities, it is a very mild angina, what we call a class one Canadian cardiovascular society angina. So you should make a diagnosis of angina. You should also classify what is the severity of angina based on Canadian Cardiovascular Society severity of that. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> next slide, please. Yeah, okay. 
Now, while we are talking about the chest pain, there is one more condition which is equally serious, probably more serious than a coronary artery disease. Is a dissecting and the reason wherein there is separation of the intima from the media uh, by by uh, by the blood that is occupying it. There is a tear in the intima of the aorta, and then it goes on dissecting it, separating the intima from the media. This is what we call dissection aneurysm of aorta. That also causes chest discomfort. It can affect the ascending aorta. When it does, you do get an anterior chest pain. But more often than not, it is a dissection of the descending thoracic aorta beyond the left subclavian artery that's far more frequent. In those conditions that the chest discomfort is mostly in the interscapular region. Sometimes this pain can also extend to the abdominal region because as the dissection progresses from the descending thoracic to the abdominal aorta, the pain also migrates. But more important than, than, the, than the location of the discomfort is that the chest pain is severe at the onset. Severe stabbing, piercing. Severe enough, he says, the patient says, I can't bear it, I couldn't bear it. So that is the kind of pain. Severe at onset and then becomes less and then persists for hours to days. In contrast, the anginal pain is very mild. Initially, you feel what is something we are not feeling normal. Then gradually, it, it keeps on building up. It becomes more and more severe. So it is a crescendo type of chest pain in patients with angina. Whereas in a dissecting aneurysm, the pain is severe or maximal at the onset. And then comes down and then stays for hours to days. In contrast, the pain in angina is mild to start with, increases, and usually lasts not more than 15 to 20 minutes, unless the patient has gone to develop an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction. We should suspect dissecting aneurysm whenever the patient has got an uncontrolled hypertension. That's the biggest risk factor for development of dissecting aneurysm. But don't forget that even non-hypertensives can also get dissecting aneurysm. Especially dissecting aneurysm is missed out in the youngsters. Because we often feel that this hypertension is beyond the age of 35, 40. So we don't even consider it. But in patients having Marfan syndrome or Erlers Danlos syndrome with connective tissue disorders, it can have dissecting aneurysm without the patient having any hypertension. Same thing applies in the postpartum period. Young female delivered. One week after that, the patient says she's having severe, unbearable pain in the interscapular region. Please do not ignore it. It may not be a coronary, but it may be a dissecting and the reason. That the reason why pregnancy induces dissecting and the reason is during pregnancy, structural changes do occur both in arteries as well as veins. And the structural change that occurs in pregnancy in the arteries is myxomatous degeneration of the media. It is partly reversible, but that is the basis why in the postpartum period that the dissecting aneurysms are not uncommon. So if a lady soon after delivery complains of pain in the interscapular region, consider the possibility of a dissecting aneurysm. Now, recently some data has come out some drugs like foraminoquinolines, when they are used for long term or more frequently, they are a bit more prone to develop dissecting aneurysm. It is something like usage of foraminoquinoline. I'm sure you must have heard of a rupture of the actually tendon being more frequent. These drugs seem to interfere with the synthesis of collagen. So this failure of synthesis of collagen is responsible for making them more prone to develop a dissecting aneurysm of aorta. This is still a subject of uh, being uh, in evaluation, but keep that in mind. So take a drug history, whether the patient has been using any drugs long term or more frequently. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> <coughs> Having said that dissecting aneurysms causes chest pain most of the time, 
it is important that uh, dissecting aneurysms can also occur without pain, but it's very, very infrequent. In the international history of aortic, dejection, aortic dissection, only 3.7% of the patients with dissection had no pain at all. This painless dissection is more common in the elderly, and that's the reason for delayed recognition, because there's no pain, we don't even suspect it. And because of delayed recognition, the mortality is also higher. So keep that in mind that dissecting aneurysms can, can occur even without pain. Especially this will happen when you have asymmetry of the pulses, either in the lower limbs or in the upper limbs. Can I have the next slide? So the third common or the second common symptom of a cardiac disease is the dyspnea. What do we mean by dyspnea? Dyspnea means awareness of difficulty in breathing. It's purely subjective, although objectively we see them having tachypnea, labored respiration, usage of X-ray muscles of respiration. But by and large, dyspnea is, is a subjective symptoms. And the causes of dyspnea can be cardiac, it can be pulmonary, or it can even be systemic disorders like anemia or even musculoskeletal disorders like skeletal myopathies. So these are all, there are various causes of dyspnea. How do we, you know, commonly it is basically two major factors, two major diseases are the cause of dyspnea. One is cardiac, other one is pulmonary. How do we distinguish at the by history? Now if the pulmonary disease is the cause of dyspnea, usually there is some evidence of pulmonary disease by way of cough with expectoration, history of weeds, seasonal variation, history of allergy, all these things are there. In the absence of that, the patient develops dyspnea for the first time without history of wheezing, probably you should suspect a cardiac dyspnea. What is the mechanism of dyspnea? Dyspnea is, is, can be easily explained in patients with left heart failure. What happens is when, the, when there is a left heart failure, the pressure in the left ventricular diastole rises. Consequently, the pressure in the left atrium increases. And when the left atrial pressure increases beyond the oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure means that the osmotic pressure or oncotic pressure or the pressure that keeps the fluid within the vessel lumen. And that is basically uh, maintained by the plasma proteins. The normal oncotic pressure is about 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. When the left atrial pressure increases to more than 30 millimeters of mercury, then the hydrostatic pressure, that is the pressure within the left atrium, increases over and above the oncotic pressure. That causes the fluid to be driven into the interstitial space. And that interstitial space is the lung. So that the interstitium of the lung is filled with water. So the lung becomes rigid. Once the lung becomes rigid, it takes more effort to expand the lung, a rigid lung, rather than a very, very compliant lung when there is only air and no fluid. And probably you can, you can uh, suspect that there is an ongoing uh, what you call dyspnea or pulmonary edema, because initially there is only tachypnea. Even when you auscultate, there may not be any crepitations. For that matter, there may be some amount of V's may be there, which might lead you to think it may be bronchial. This V's is because of submucosal edema within the bronchi that causes narrowing of the lumen, and that causes the V's. So be, even before these crepitations appear. These crepitations appear only when the fluid spills over from the interstitial space into the alveoli. So crepitations is a very late phenomenon. So the first thing is patient with cardiac disease having tachypnea suspect that he is an impending pulmonary edema. So the basis of dyspnea in patient with left heart failure is the hydrostatic pressure. This is what we call Starling's equation. That means when the hydrostatic pressure exceeds the oncotic pressure, the fluid goes into the interstitial space. So, 
So the basic mechanism is rise in the hydrostatic pressure, which is the pressure in the LA or in the pulmonary veins. <coughs> now, what about the other causes of dyspnea? Sometimes you do develop dyspnea even in patient with right heart failure. They say they can't walk, they get breathless. Patient with uh, cyanosis also have decreased uh, particular exercise capacity. So various other reasons are given. Any condition that causes a decrease in the cardiac output to the causing decreased flow of the blood to the muscles of respiration or any condition that causes a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood like in cyanosis, it will also result in dyspnea. So by and large, dyspnea is, uh, is a serious symptom and uh, important cause of dyspnea is cardiovascular diseases. Now there are other varieties of dyspnea which have been described and you should also know about it. One is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, other one is orthopnea, other one is fourth one is uh, platypnea and uh, tripopnea and recently one more pnea has been added which is called bendopnea. Can we have the next slide? <coughs> <coughs> So what is orthopnea? Orthopnea is the patient becomes more breathless when the patient lies flat and then he immediately gets up and sits up because he says he feels comfortable and no discomfort and no difficulty in breathing. The reason is when you lie flat, there is shift of the blood from the lower limbs into the thorax. How much, of, how much amount of blood is shifted? Approximately 500 ml of blood. So it is an auto transfusion of 500 ml of blood from the uh, periphery to the to the intrathoracic area, and that raises the left atrial pressure, and that causes pulmonary venous congestion, and that causes the dyspnea. So the orthopnea it indicates indirectly that the left atrial pressure is very high, and any further transfusion of the fluids or auto-transfusion like when you lie down flat, certainly it will increase the hydrostatic pressure more and will make the patient more breathless. What is the other one is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Unlike orthopnea, here a patient goes to bed comfortably, but then wakes up after about four or five hours in the middle of the night, saying that he's breathless. He gets up out of the bed, stands down and then does some sort of a uh, walking around the room and then opens the windows classically because he feels that there is less amount of oxygen coming to him. And after some time, he goes back to bed comfortably. <coughs> that the reason for this kind of a this thing is, is this time lag represents the time taken for the interstitial fluid in the lower limbs that has come down into the vascular system and then that will cause an increase in the venous volume and that causes a rise in the left atrial pressure and that causes the left atrial pressure increasing, causing venous congestion, pulmonary congestion, lung becomes more stiffer. So that is the reason why there is a time lag. Unlike orthopnea, nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea is immediate shift of the blood from the lower limbs towards the thorax. Whereas in PND, the interstitial fluid has to be absorbed back from the interstitial spaces to the vascular system. So that takes hours. That is the reason why orthopnea is a much, much more serious rather than PNDs. But remember, orthopnea and PND indicates a serious left heart failure. Okay. Now there is one more condition called bendopnea, wherein there is when the patient bends forward for lasting for more than 30 seconds, he becomes breathless. But basically because again, there is increase in the preload because when you do bending, the abdominal compression increase in venous return. So all these... Are <laughs> the... So all these things, orthopnea, PND, bendopnea, are all because of increase in preload at various points of time. Orthopnea is immediate, bendopnea is immediate, but PND takes four to five hours. 
Okay. Nocturnal cough is a very subtle sign of left heart failure because they, the lungs are congested. So patient starts off by coughing. You should not mistake it as what we call post-nasal discharge, which it can be, but consider the possibility of an incipient left heart failure. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> so, <coughs> what is the importance of dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, nocturnal cough? It not only says that there is a heart disease, but it tells you that the heart disease is because of left heart diseases. Any condition that is going to affect the left heart, mitral wall disease, left ventricular failure, aortic wall disease, or systemic hypertension. So paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or tapnea, you should certainly evaluate and look for it because it not only tells you that the patient has got a heart disease, it also tells you that the pathology is in the left side of the heart and not in the right side of the heart. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, not only uh, like the what we call chest pain, you should also grade the type of dyspnea or the seriousness of the dyspnea. And we generally use uh, NYHA classifications. Can I have the next slide? So there are other methods of grading the dyspnea apart from NYHA, what we call modified MRC. But in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, WHO has devised a gra another grading of dyspnea or functional class limitations, wherein they have included syncope apart from dyspnea in grading the severity of the disease. In case of children, there is a, another method called modified ROS classification of the severity of the functional impairment. Can I have the next slide? Okay, now unlike what we call orthopnea, there is one condition called platypnea orthodeoxia. Okay, this is exactly the reverse of orthopnea. In orthopnea, a patient is comfortable sitting up and feels what you call discomfort when he, when he lies down. In this platypnea orthodeoxia, Patient is very comfortable lying down, but becomes symptomatic when the patient sits up. And uh, if you measure the pulse oximetry, oxygen saturations, oxygen saturation when he's lying down is normal, but when he sits up, it falls. From about uh, 94, 95, it falls to 85, 82. So this is exactly the reverse of orthopnea. This condition is rather rare, but it has been described. So it is, if some patient says he's comfortable lying down, but then becomes more breathless when he sits up, think of the condition called pretapnea. This is basically a right to left shunting, intracardiac or intrapulmonary, like pulmonary AV fistulas. And then they're comfortable lying down, and then uh, they become symptomatic when they, when they sit up. But the reason is because, can I have the next slide? But when the patient sits up, there is an alteration in the shape of the atrial septal defect communication, which is there most of the time. It changes its shape such a way that it facilitates the IVC flow into the left atrium, even in the absence of pulmonary arterial hypertension in that particular patient. It can be ASD, it can be PFO also. But this is a rare condition, platypnea, orthodeoxia. But just keep it in mind that if the patient says comfortable lying, uncomfortable sitting, consider this. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so while we are the subject of uh, what you call pain and dyspnea, one of the important symptoms, which is not often evaluated, is the claudication. When we talk about claudication, we often think of claudication only of the lower limbs because they're the most frequent what they call lead, lower extremity arterial disease. Claudication coming on, on effort, and relieved by rest, is something similar to the coronary artery anginal pain. So claudication can be called as angina of the peripheral muscles. Unlike the cardiac muscle angina, this is angina of the peripheral skeletal muscles. 
Commonly, we say it's an atherosclerotic obstruction of the iliofemoral system or even lower end of the aorta at the bifurcation level extending into the iliac vessels. But remember, claudication can also occur in the upper limbs. Classically, in our country, we see Takayashu arteritis. But sometimes, the claudication can, be, can occur even in the jaw, lower jaw. If the patient says that while masticating it, he gets the pain, when he is eating food and is masticating it, he gets the pain in the lower jaw, he has to stop for a while and then again start chewing. Think of temporal arteritis, which is not often thought of. So Takayashu arteritis in the upper limb, temporal arteritis for the jaw pain, are often underestimated. The importance of remembering the claudication is not only that it, uh, it points to the a possible occlusive artery, like in a subclavian artery in a Takayashu or a temporal artery in case of jaw pain. But in patients with lower limbs, if the claudication starts from the gluteal region, at the level of obstruction in the lower limb arteries is at the level of the iliac vessels. If it is in the thigh, it is femoral. If it is in the calf, it is a popliteal. So, you should not only ask for the presence of the claudication, you should also ask where does the pain start and where does it go. Initially, it starts off from the, from the, from the distal most region because that's the distal areas get the last drops of blood. So although it starts off in the, it is maximal in the distal areas, but it starts off in the, in the, in the gluteal region, then the obstruction is in the iliofemoral vessels. So it not only gives you that, that, the, that the presence of occlusive vascular disease, but it also tells you at what level is the occlusive vascular disease. This is very important. Suppose your patient has got atypical chest pain, or he has only, uh, what do you call, two out of the three components of the ischemia. And then if you find a patient has got a peripheral vascular disease, the probability of that patient having a coronary artery disease is extremely high. Because there is evidence of obstruction elsewhere, most probably it is atherosclerotic. But in case of young patients, it can be Takayashu arteritis, it can be temporal arteritis. Not to forget about prothrombotic conditions like uh, APLA syndrome, antiphospholipid antibody syndromes. So, finally, you should not only remember the, whether there is claudication or not, we should also know, like in angina, that the rate of progression of the angina, of the claudication. If there is a rapid progression of claudication, coupled with elevated inflammatory markers in the blood, it points out the presence of inflammatory or iota arteritis or arteritis of any etiology. Remember, this temporal arteritis is called giant cell arteritis. It can not only affect the temporal vessels, it can also affect the iliofemoral vessels. So, if there's a rapid progression of symptoms, the positive inflammatory markers in the blood, think of the possibility of an arteritis as the cause rather than atherosclerotic. I agree that atherosclerotic occlusion can also have rapid progression because of a subintimal hemorrhage or a superadded thrombus. But this is one of the things to be complete. But in those patients, there is no rise in the inflammatory markers, unlike in arteritis. Can I have the next slide? Okay, that is, that is. third uh, symptom of cardiovascular diseases is the palpitation. A very common, common complaint, but then you should uh, take some time to ask what exactly the patient means by saying palpitation. Is he aware of the rapid heart action all the time, even at rest and other things? Or is the rapid heart action occurring in paroxysms? If he is aware of only a, of the heart action, is different from aware of rapid heart action. Aware of the heart action means there is volume overloaded ventricles. It can be mitral regurgitation, it can be aortic regurgitation, it can be severe tricuspid regurgitation. So you should make a clear distinction when you say palpitation. Are you aware of the heart action or is your heart beating rapidly? The heart 
aging rapidly, you can ask the fellow to tap it on the table and then tell us how fast it is beating. Not only how fast it is beating, is it regular or irregular? He says sometimes it skips. So first and foremost is when the patient says palpitation, he is aware of the heartbeat or is there a rapid heart action? Now, if you, as I said, if there is a rapid heart action, that means there is, especially if it is occurring paroxysms, then it is probably dysrhythmias <coughs> caused by arrhythmias. So if it is arrhythmias, you should, you should ask, what is the onset? Sudden onset? Gradual onset. How long it is lasting? Five minutes? One hour? Two hours? During the episodes of this rapid heart action, are there any associated symptoms? Like feeling giddy or becoming very breathless or feeling of even blackout during that time. It is generally believed that ventricular tachyarrhythmias, especially in the setting of a structural heart disease, is very more symptomatic than supraventricular tachycardias occurring in an otherwise structurally normal heart. That the reason is that in ventricular tachycardias or ventricular tachyarrhythmias, there is loss of atrial kick. Atrium contraction contributes almost about 15, 10 to 15 percent of the left ventricle filling. So suddenly, if you lose the atrial contribution to the ventricular filling, more so in a patient who has got a structurally abnormal heart like left ventricular hypertrophy, then there will be a steep fall in the left ventricular input, consequently the output. So he is likely to become more symptomatic by way of giddiness or even syncope. So it is important that you go to it, how often it happens, and what is the... Uh, clinical status of the patient during tachyarrhythmias. And uh, are there any drugs which the patient is taking which can cause potential arrhythmias? Don't forget, there are some drugs which can cause prolongation of the QTC and then cause ventricular tachyarrhythmias. That are the, that the prokinetic drugs given by the gastroenterologists are all prokinetic. That the present day COVID era, the combination of azithromycin and other things can also cause prolongation of the KT and uh, polymorphic VTs are not uncommon. So it is important that you, whenever a patient has a palpitation, is he aware of the heart action or is there any proximal rapid heart action? Is he taking any drugs which can potentially cause this is it symptomatic during tachycardia or not symptomatic? All these things will give you a lot of insight for the possible cause. Can I have the next slide, please? Syncope. This is a very important symptom, and most of the time when a patient has syncope, he invariably comes to this just to see the doctor without anybody asking him to go to see a doctor. And quite often that they end up with the, with, the, with the wrong specialist. They often tend to go to the neurologist because they feel that basically there is something wrong with the neurological system. They are right in some, to some extent when they say neurologist because syncope is due to global reduction of the blood flow to the brain. Mark the word global reduction. That is basically because there is a marked sudden decrease in the cardiac output, for whatever reason, we'll come to that. But when somebody says syncope, history plays a very, very important part in the evaluation of the patient. Is the syncope occurring at rest or on effort? This is very important. Or is it occurring what we call situational syncope? Is he getting syncope during the prolonged cough? Is he getting syncope? during maturation? Is he getting syncope during deglutition? So on and so forth. So it is important that you take history properly. Or is he getting syncope on prolonged standing? Like in school, some of the school drills where they make you stand for about one hour during the process of drill. So, so asking the details of that is important. Exertional syncope, if it is present, 
is a very ominous sign of a cardiovascular disease. It is important to know about this because exertional syncope is synonymous with LV outflow tract obstruction like aortic stenosis or even hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It can also occur even in right ventricle outflow tract obstruction like severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. But common to both is a steep decrease in the cardiac output during the effort. <coughs> So why does that happen? Because of obstruction, the need to have an increased cardiac output cannot take place because of severe obstruction in case of severe aortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstruction to cardiomyopathy. Coupled with the inadequate cardiac output, there is inappropriate vasodilatation. Why does it occur inappropriate vasodilatation? Because there is stimulation of the mechanoreceptors within the endocardium of the ventricle. So this decrease or inadequate cardiac output coupled with inappropriate vasodilatation causes a marked decrease in the cerebral perfusion which causes syncope. So this syncope by and large is usually, in, at least in the majority of the people, is associated with premonitory symptoms. On the contrary, if the patient says he is getting syncope while sitting, then you need to suspect that the patient might, is having probably a arrhythmias. Syncope at rest without premonitory symptoms is an arrhythmic event, especially in the background of an established cardiac disease. For example, a patient has got a cardiomyopathy on decongestive therapy, and then the parents or, or some of the attendants bring the patient saying that, he was sitting in the chair and then suddenly fell off. That means the patient has got, probably has got a major ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Although other causes are possible, but this is one of the most dangerous things because it can lead to sudden cardiac death. So basically, you need to evaluate syncope a bit more detail. That is, what is the history of, is it occurring at rest or an effort? If it is occurring at rest, what is the position of the patient, sitting, standing, or lying? And what are the situations on which, during which the syncope occur? What do you call coughing, or mixuration, or any of any such situation, like including deglutition? So that will give you a, a better answer than any other investigations which you may like to pursue subsequently. Can I have the next slide? <coughs> a pre-syncope is a word that has been used more, not, not only, uh, mostly by the, by the doctors. And according to the ESC guidelines, what is pre-syncope? Pre-syncope is occurrence of pre-monetary symptoms, like lightheadedness, graying of vision, nausea, uneasiness in the chest, before the syncope. So pre-syncope is pre-monetary symptoms, without uh, loss of consciousness is pre -syncope. But it's what you call diagnostic value is rather limited. It's a non-specific thing. So you should not give so much of uh, what you call uh, importance in evaluation of pre -syncope. Can I have the next slide? Okay, finally edema of the lower extremities hospital dependent, is quite often a sign of a right heart failure. It is a consequence of increased systemic venous pressure. Same thing is applicable here, like the Starling's law. Hydrostatic pressure exceeding the oncotic pressure. So there is fluid leakage into the interstitial space, and that's what we are calling as edema. So cardiac edema is a pitting edema, is a non-tender edema, it is bilateral, it is very slow in onset and probably responds very well to the diuretic therapy. If it is a late evening edema of the feet, patient says he is okay in the morning, but then late evening o'clock he gets edema of the feet, then there are only, <coughs> there are only two conditions. Either they, it is related to the venous insufficiency, chronic venous insufficiency, <coughs> <coughs> or 
related to long term usage of calcium tablets diet to put it in group of drugs the worst offender is the nephidipine whatever it is if the edema is appearing is not there in the morning hours and disappear and appearing only in the later part of the day suspect chronic venous insufficiency and also take the drug history what are the drugs the patient is taking now ascites that is fluid in the peritoneal cavity is also a manifestation of right heart failure but there are very few conditions uh, ascites is not as uh, frequent as uh, the dependent edema occasionally ascites even precedes the dependent edema there is only one condition like that that is what we call ascites precox ascites preceding the edema of the feet and quite often it is mistaken for cirrhosis of the liver so ascites preceding the edema of the feet is equivalent to constrictive pericarditis that is a rule unless proved otherwise there are other reasons but consider as a if the patient says his abdominal girth is increasing for the last 6 months only now he has developed edema of the feet it can still be cirrhosis of the liver with ascites but there is also a possibility of a what we call constrictive pericarditis so it is said that in all patients with cirrhosis of the liver with ascites you should always look at the jugular vein especially cirrhosis of the liver will never have elevated jugular vein especially if the jugular vein especially is elevated in a patient with cirrhosis of the liver it is constrictive pericarditis or a restrictive cardiomyopathy until proved otherwise there are other reasons but by and large these are all the rules of thumb so ascites you should look for it and ascites indicates usually a serious right sided disease especially tricuspid valve disease can i have the next slide okay cyanosis is the last uh, symptom actually what is it, what do you mean by cyanosis is a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes where does the color really come from is a reflection of the color of the blood in the capillaries and that blood becomes blue only when the reduced hemoglobin is more than 5 grams per deciliter okay so if the normally when there is cyanosis the arterial oxygen saturation is less than 85% you put a pulse oximeter in a patient who is cyanosed the arterial saturation will be less than 85% now there are two caveats here one is in conditions of anemia and in conditions of polycythemia in anemia there may be severe desaturation but yet there may not be cyanosis because hemoglobin itself is 7 grams and even if you decrease the what do you call uh, reduced hemoglobin by 50% the reduced hemoglobin will be only 3.5 grams so in the presence of anemia it is cyanosis can be very misleading it does not occur even though there is serious desaturation on the contrary in polycythemia where the hemoglobin is very very high like 20 grams per deciliter even if there is a fall of the hemoglobin to 90 90% there will be marked cyanosis because there 10% fall in the in the oxygen saturation will result in more than 5 grams out of 20 grams so with these two caveats by and large assuming that the hemoglobin level is normal which is about 13 to 15 grams per deciliter cyanosis means the saturation is less than 85% and the amount of reduced hemoglobin is more than 5 grams per deciliter can i have the next slide okay cyanosis is often defined as whether it is central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis quite often people misunderstand the central and peripheral cyanosis does not mark the word does not refer to the distribution of cyanosis it refers to the mechanism of cyanosis in central cyanosis there is intracardiac or intrapulmonary right to left shunting whereas in peripheral cyanosis there is increased extraction of oxygen because of decreased cardiac output 
there is increased extraction of oxygen by the tissues that increases the reduced hemoglobin to more than 5 grams. And that is the cause for appearance of cyanosis. So cyanosis is central and peripheral. It refers to the mechanism of cyanosis, not to the distribution of cyanosis. Having said that, subtle cyanosis, usually the, that the, that the limbs are very warm. And in cyanosis, peripheral cyanosis, usually the limbs are cold. And basically because there is decreased cardiac output in peripheral cyanosis. Okay, so remember that central cyanosis, you look at the conjunctiva, look at the mucous membrane of the mouth and the tongue and the nails beds, uh, assuming that the limbs are quite warm. Okay, can I have the next slide? So, although cardiac disease <coughs> presents with a lot of uh, symptoms referable to the cardiovascular system, Occasionally, these symptoms can be referred to the other systems like respiratory system or neurological symptoms, especially cardioembolic strokes. So all patients with stroke suspect there may be a cardiogenic cause of stroke. That's very important. Pyrexia of unknown origin can be a manifestation of infective endocarditis, native wall or a prosthetic wall. So it is important that you, you keep it in mind that it can manifest with uh, symptoms referred to other systems. Can I have the next slide? So now, having evaluated all these symptoms, finally, you want to know whether it is interfering with his lifestyle, whether it is interfering with his ordinary physical activities. So, the functional disability consequent to the symptoms is important. So, you <coughs> if the CV disorders are severe enough as to interfere with the normal activities or ordinary physical activities, that means the disease is pretty severe. And this is a major indication for treatment, not necessarily surgery or angioplasties or some other non-surgical procedures, but it is an indication for starting of therapy. So the presence of a serious symptoms not only indicate the presence of disease, but also the seriousness of the disease. But then how do we evaluate the functional disabilities? Can I have the next slide? Okay, you yes, skip this slide. Next one. Next one. Yeah, okay. So how do we evaluate the functional capacity or what do you call functional disabilities? There's a, there is an objective way of doing it called Duke Activity Status Index. You forget about all those things. Just remember, you need to ask a patient four questions. Can he do self-care activities? That means, can he dress, undress, can he shave, can he do the brushing, can he take bath on his own? That is called self-care activities. Can you do household activities? That means, can you walk indoors? Can you do dusting or dishwashing in case of females or otherwise? Or can you climb one flight of stairs? Then, recreational activities. Gardening, running for short distance, playing with your kids and other things. They're all recreational activities. Finally. Does he play any games? Does he play any, what do you call, vigorous games or not? All this one will give you some idea, objective idea, about his functional capacity. Functional capacity, scientifically speaking, has to be expressed in terms of METs. MET means metabolic equivalent. Each metabolic equivalent is equal to 3.5 ml per kg per minute is the oxygen consumed. That means at rest, we are, we are having only one met of work. That means no activity, just lying down in the bed. So if you're a 70 kg man, you're consuming 70 into 3.5 ml of oxygen. That is about 210 plus 30, about 240, 250 ml of oxygen per minute. Any further activity is expressed as multiples of mets. For example, self-care activities is 2.75 meters, uh, 
METs to three METs. The, the most demanding self-care activity, which, which requires more oxygen consumption, is taking a bath by himself, which consumes, which costs about three METs of work. Okay, so if the patient is able to take care of or take bath without having chest pain, without having dyspnea, without having palpitations, that means he's, he's okay, at least he's not very severe. Now, if he's, if he's able to do self-care activities, but not able to do household activities, that is what we call class 3. So class 3 means serious disease, and that calls for urgent investigations and treatment. Recreational activities, class 2. Sporting activities is class 1. So you need to ask the patient these questions. Can you, take, can you do self-care activities? Is he comfortable? Can he do an ordinary household activities? Yes. And recreational activities. Then probably it will give you some idea that what is the level of functional disability. Can I have the last slide, please? So, for all the people who are listening to me, see, the symptoms evaluation is very important, which I've alluded to already. It will tell you the presence of disease. It will tell you the severity of the disease. It will tell you the progression of the disease. So symptoms are very, very important. And some of these symptoms point to a specific disease. For example, presence of PND, orthopnea, almost always indicate a left heart disease. Just as effort syncope indicates left ventricular outflow tract obstruction like aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Awareness of the heart, heart beating, but not rapid heart beating, indicates cardiomegaly, usually due to a volume overloaded ventricle. Okay, and then the amount of functional disability that he has, patient has, dictates the timing of investigations and interventions. And finally, evaluation of the symptoms after therapy also indicates whether the therapy has been successful or otherwise. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I'll take on any questions if you have any. Shantanu. Morning, sir. Sudhakar, yes, sir. Uh, I, I, Sudhakar, yes, sir. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. I'll pass on the question, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, uh, yeah, dyspnea in uh, isolated right heart failure. That's what I have said already. That is basically because the skeletal muscle gets exhausted because of low cardiac output. Yeah. Also, the orthopnea mechanism in uh, like right heart failure, a few diseases which cause orthopnea and right heart. Orthopnea is uh, certainly a case. Orthopnea. If you really take the, you know, orthopnea has to be evaluated properly. But if you are convinced that the patient has got orthopnea, then it is a sign of a left heart disease. Orthopnea and PND. These two are very specific. Although there are other diseases. For example, you know, there are, uh, what do you call, ENT diseases which can cause orthopneas. But uh, that should not be mistaken. But by and large, if you say patient has got a dyspnea or exertion and he has uh, orthopnea and PND, he has got a cardiac disease and you need to focus your uh, investigations and examination to the left side of the heart. Whether he has any left atrial, mitral wall, left ventricle, aortic wall, iota, all those things we need to be evaluated. By and large, that is the same. Now, there are some situations like patients having constrictive pericarditis. The huge ascites, when they lie down flat, they are restless, they are, they are not very comfortable. That should not be interpreted as orthopnea. He should wake up, he, he should get up with breathlessness, not, not because of uncomfortableness. So there are situations wherein there are massive, what you call ascites, or severe uh, uh, hepatomegaly consequent to right heart failure. That will also make them uncomfortable when they when they really lie down. But that should not be equated with uh, orthopnea. Okay, sir. 
uh, can you please explain the syncope in AS again, sir? Like uh, different mechanisms of syncope in AS. Yeah, syncope is uh, syncope is basically because of global hyperperfusion of the brain. <coughs> It is not due to a isolated carotid artery stenosis or a bilateral carotid artery stenosis. It is globally there is decrease in the perfusion of the brain. <coughs> and the syncope is uh, what we call, uh, you have to ask whether syncope is occurring at rest or on effort. I'll explain to you why they have, why they have uh, what we call uh, effort syncope in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis, Waldner aortic stenosis. So what happens in Waldner aortic stenosis is because of severe aortic stenosis, patient is not able to increase the amount of cardiac output proportional to the exercise. What is the, what is the proportion is for every 100 ml increase in oxygen consumption by the body, the heart has to increase its output by about 600 ml per minute. Now, now, if that is not able to improve, it, uh, improve its cardiac output, then it becomes an inadequate cardiac output. And this inadequate cardiac output in response to exercise, coupled with inappropriate vasodilatation of the periphery, consequent to stimulation of the mechanoreceptors within the endocardium of the ventricle. So the combination of low output coupled with inappropriate vasodilatation that causes most of the blood to go away from the brain to these working muscles. And that is the reason why the brain gets less blood and that is the reason why they have syncope. Now the syncope at rest is due to most of the time, as I said, is due to the arrhythmias. Sometimes you also get what we call vasovagal attack. It is a reflex syncope. I will not go into the details of syncope, but situational syncope is also like that. Cough syncope is because of continuous cough, there is a decrease in the venous return to the to the heart because of raised you know, intrathoracic pressure. So decreased venous return really results in decreased output of the left ventricle, which results in decreased perfusion to the brain and consequently loss of consciousness, what we are calling it as syncope. So these are all basically fundamental to the syncope is global hyperperfusion. Uh, mechanism of uh, syncope and pulmonary embolism, I just saw it. It is a manifestation of major severe obstruction, sudden severe decrease in cardiac output. They have syncope. That uh, syncope and pulmonary embolism is a very bad sign. They have got a very poor prognosis. I've seen patients where the, what do you call, CT angio proved massive pulmonary, saddle embolism sitting in the pulmonary, main pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. They rarely survive, but they do survive if you recognize them early and give them appropriate uh, thermolytic therapy or even embolectin. So, basic to the uh, syncope in pulmonary embolism is marked decrease in uh, sudden severe decrease in cardiac output. Then there is a question of what is the mechanism of ascites precox? Ascites precox, nobody has explained till today, okay. but it does occur. Then uh, other mechanisms of uh, PND apart from the important one you told, sir. Other mechanisms of PND, sir. PND, what I said, no, no. Other other reasons, one. Yeah. I have given only hemodynamic mechanism of the PND. Other reasons have been given in the sense that uh, there are uh, abnormal uh, stimulation of J receptors, which causes abrupt cessation of the inspiration consequent to hemorrhage reflex. There are uh, other, uh, what do you call, uh, inappropriate response to the respiratory center. But by and large, only the hemodynamic mechanism is the most accepted and most definitive one. Uh, why uh, uh, nocturnal en uh, angina in syphilis, sir? Like that. Uh, actually, there is, uh, in, in syphilis, actually there is aortic regurgitation as well as narrowing of the, uh, what do you call, uh, osteo of the coronary arteries. I guess mostly what we call uh, it is this aortic regurgitation that becomes worse uh, during the night time, as I alluded to. During night time, there is bradycardia, relative bradycardia. So the duration of diastole becomes longer 
and uh, so the consequently the aortic regurgitation becomes more and more, more in magnitude and consequently more distension of the lv and consequently more demand of, for oxygen comes as as a result of laplace's law wall stress increases so more demand for oxygen which is the, which cannot be met by the stenosed coronary arteries nocturnal and okay. there any specific mechanism for propopnea sir like sorry propopnea <coughs> Tepopnea is uh, dyspnea on lying down to one side. Tepopnea. This is usually happens uh, when you lie opposite to the pleural effusion site, because the other side also can't expand and the normal side also can't expand. Although they are all described, how often have you seen tepopnea and uh, uh, platypnea? Not very common, sir. Yeah, it is not very common. it has to be very massive and uh, you know patient has to be very sensitive you, you usually you lie down on the same side as the as the what do you call um, as the as the diseased side because at least the normal side is working suppose assuming that the pleural effusion is massive on the right side and then you lie down on the left side and then you have uh, both sides not working that causes more uh, more distress Tepopnea is, by definition, is dyspnea on lying. It's only what do you call um, uh, uh, decubitus uh, dyspnea, lying to one side causing dyspnea. <coughs> How much weight is given to the anginal equivalence? Sorry, what was the question? Anginal equivalence. Like, uh huh. What, uh, do, uh, oh, what do you mean by anginal equivalence? Actually, yes. <coughs> actually you see the problem is there is you need to understand what we call ischemic cascade when you cause uh, what do you call uh, decrease in the coronary blood flow abrupt decrease in the coronary blood flow whatever may be the mechanism or abrupt increase in the demand for oxygen the, the cardiac muscle becomes ischemic so what happens in the uh, the in the ischemic cascade is the first change that occurs is the biochemical change within the cardiac muscle followed by mechanical abnormalities first initially diastolic dysfunction followed by systolic dysfunction then followed by electrical changes by way of st segment deviations finally followed by symptom of angina so basically when we say anginal equivalence we mean equivalence of ischemia other than chest pain so equivalence of ischemia other than chest pain or the dyspnea flash pulmonary edemas and uh, basically we say sometimes you do develop syncope on effort syncope on effort is a very bad uh, what do you call uh, sign or or even a symptom of coronary artery disease that can be due to because there is uh, so much area of the muscle is dysfunctional because of ischemia let us say this lm severe here lm severe disease then you have uh, the whole 90% of your lv myocardium is uh, ischemic and suddenly you get into serious difficulties and cardiac output falls or sometimes even precipitation of arrhythmias which might cause symptoms so anginal equivalence by definition is ischemic manifestations of the lv of the of the cardiac muscle other than pain when we say silent ischemia it is totally different okay any question sir does this bendopnea points to a specific group of diseases like do not actually like bendopnea has been described only in uh, 90s uh, that is when they have when, when the patient is bending forward to tie his boot laces he is getting dyspnea and that has been equated with uh, hemodynamic profile of what we call type c profile where type c prof hemodynamic profile is elevated uh, filling pressures and decreased cardiac output so there is basically they are uh, on the border line of a uh, dysfunction which is aggravated by bending forward consequently causing abdominal compression increase in the preload and that is the cause of his uh, worsening of the symptoms 
He is not totally asymptomatic otherwise. He is symptomatic, under control with drug therapy and then becomes worse whenever he bets. Oh. Is one question on what will be the saturation of oxygen when dyspnea starts manifesting? I did not, I did not understand this question. Sir, when, sir, when dyspnea starts in which condition? Manifesting, sir. When dyspnea starts manifesting. Uh, manifesting, okay. Actually, first thing that happens is the tachypnea. <coughs> tachypnea is basically because it cannot take a deep breath. Inspiration is interrupted. So, in order to compensate for the loss of depth of the inspiration, it increases the rate. Basically, because the rate increases, basically because that the lung becomes more rigid. So, the saturation will start to fall uh, probably about 90, uh, 95 downwards. And then by the time they develop what do you call uh, frank pulmonary edema, it may go as low as 85, 86. And the fall in the saturation in pulmonary edema is basically because of ventilation perfusion mismatch, because it can be corrected by giving oxygen. It is not due to a diffusion problem. It is basically a ventilation perfusion mismatch that causes this, uh, what do you call, uh, fall in saturation and dyspnea. There is one last question, sir. Can we be sir. specific based on symptom whether it is purely right heart failure or left heart failure? No, no, no. Symptoms, you know, clinical medicine has got its own limitations. I think if we need, all of us need to understand that our, uh, no matter how good you are as a clinician, your, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, ability to pinpoint the diagnosis to be very accurate, at best is 60%, 70%. It cannot be more than that. And to differentiate between uh, right heart failure from the left heart failure is possible. But remember that the commonest cause of a right heart failure is left heart failure. So whenever there is a right heart failure, we need to see whether we, we need to, whether there's any underlying uh, left heart failure. In the, in the absence of left heart failure, the, at the right heart failure, can be due to car pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, a lot of other conditions. Primarily right ventricular diseases, including right ventricular cardiomyopathies, right ventricular restrictive cardiomyopathies. But by and large, uh, we do, you know, uh, the symptoms, as I said, PND and arthropnea is uh, probably indicates that the left heart disease, at least to start off. For then, if you find elevated jugular venous pressure, edema of the feet, enlarged tender liver, ascites, then it is a sign of a right heart failure. With the full understanding, for example, you take mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis, we have some, uh, what do you call uh, signs and symptoms of uh, left heart disease. And ultimately, when they, when they do develop uh, pulmonary hypertension with tricuspidic agitation, they have all the right heart failure. That is a classical example of a left heart disease leading to right heart failure. So isolated right heart failure in the absence of left heart failure Yes, yes, that's a separate syndrome. So that is the reason why we say that you should start up by evaluating the left heart disease in patient with right heart failure and then proceed. Can I take one last question before? Sure, sure. The mechanism of chain stokes respiration in LV failure, sir. Uh, chain stoke respiration, actually, it is, uh, um, I'm not very sure, but uh, you read the physiology book, textbook of physiology by Best and Taylor. Okay, so I think we'll uh, conclude here. I think most of the uh, questions have been taken here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Santanu. Yes, sir. Uh, we are now towards concluding this wonderful program. I must say this, it was an exciting program which has enabled us to gain from the wisdom and expertise of the speakers and panelists. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dayasagar Rao and also Dr. Sudhakar Rao for their great contribution in making this program possible and successful. I am thankful to all participants who have taken time out of their busy schedule to attend this program. I thank all of you for making this event successful and I sincerely hope your support will remain with Torin in times to come. Thank you, goodbye and good night to all. Sir, sir thank you very much. Dr. Rao. Thank you, Shantanu. Thank you, Sudhakar. Thank you, sir. How many people logged in? Any idea? Sir, around uh, 175, sir. 175, okay. Fine. And thank, thank you very much, sir. It is a great contribution towards your students, sir.
Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.